uh, annually, and he has also received uh, uh, huge attention and spotlight by thousands of news headlines in the area of cyber deception. So with my uh, complete respect to Kevin and give him the floor to start. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Heb. Um, and thank you for uh, getting up early and uh, coming to this talk. So um, today I want to um, argue that uh, not only do I think that uh, science of cyber deception is important, I'm even going to you know, sort of go over the top and say I think that it's critical for the future of, future of uh, cybersecurity in general. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to convince you of this uh, by the end. So um, when I think about cyber deceptions, you know, one of my favorite uh, somewhat entertaining examples of a, a great cyber deception that worked extremely well um, comes from the Cold War era. Um, and this is one of the earliest forms of cyber deception that I know about. Um, so if you recall, um, you know, in the, in the mid-70s, the U.S. and Soviet Union were engaged in this arms race to try to establish uh, technological superiority. And um, the U.S. started to become aware that the Soviets were um, keeping pace by simply buying or stealing most of the uh, technological R&D that had been painstakingly developed in the, in the states. And so they decided that in order to stop this, they needed to uh, impose some really serious export restrictions on all sorts of things like software algorithms and uh, plans for various military technologies. And they tried to classify everything and keep very careful track of who was working at these various contractors. And it was an enormous expense, enormous undertaking. Uh, and unfortunately, by the early 80s, um, they sort of had to admit that this had been a complete failure. Um, the Soviets had just about every secret that they wanted. They had this massive spy campaign throughout uh, uh, the United States, and they were um, v just very good at espionage. Um, so this guy uh, by the name of Gus Weiss, who was uh, economic policy advisor at the time, um, had this bright idea that maybe instead of trying to keep all of this uh, stuff secret from the Soviets, we should take some of the um, failed R&D and put it to good use and leak it to them. So rather than trying to keep everything secret, let's just you know, take those algorithms that didn't work and mix them all in with the algorithms that did work and see if maybe we can get them to deploy some of this stuff. So they started doing that um, in this sort of uh, secret operation. And uh, I think it was in June 1982, um, NORAD detected a massive uh, three kiloton explosion somewhere in the middle of remote Siberia. And um, the White House was very alarmed. Um, it was, I think, uh, reported to be the largest explosion, non-nuclear explosion ever seen from space. Um, so something huge happened and they were afraid that maybe there was some sort of a nuclear misfire going on and uh, somebody from the National Security Council had to run down the hall to the White House and tell them, hold on, uh, th there's nothing to worry about here. We know what this is about. Um, it turns out that one of the flawed algorithms they had leaked to the Soviets was something for regulating oil pressure in the Trans-Siberian oil pipeline. And uh, instead of doing its job, that algorithm uh, fluctuated the pressure back and forth until the pipeline exploded. Um, and so uh, when the Soviets figured out that this is what had happened, they became very alarmed and started going into panic mode because they realized that all of the technologies that they had stolen uh, over the past decade might have been bugged. And so they had to then uh, you know, go back and try to do all of the uh, vetting that the Americans had been doing all along to try to distinguish the good algorithms from the bad algorithms. Um, so you know, this is, it, many analysts actually credit this move as being one of the, the uh, key strategic points that led eventually to the fall of the Soviet Union because it was just so expensive for them to undertake all of this retesting. Um, so this is an example of a sort of uh, interesting tale uh, from the Cold War era where a conventional defense that costs a whole lot of money um, had limited effectiveness, but then a, a different sort of unconventional deceptive defense uh, that cost much, much less to implement actually had a huge impact. Um, so um, yeah, I've always found this an inter interesting story and it's maybe a story that whose lessons we should start thinking about ourselves. 
So I think in the present day, we're facing um, a very serious scalability problem in cyber defense, something much more acute than uh, anything that uh, was faced during the Cold War. So um, you can see on the slide here, this is a plot I, I put together of um, uh, federal cybersecurity spending, the blue bars, um, over time, and then the, um, the number of reported cybersecurity incidents against uh, federal computer systems. And um, you can sort of see that the shapes of these curves are not the same. Um, the, the orange curve looks like it's veering towards exponential uh, sort of slope, whereas um, the blue curve is sort of going up somewhat linearly there. Um, and if that orange curve continues, I think you have to start to wonder whether any reasonable amount of cybersecurity spending is adequate to face the kind of uncontrolled explosion of attacks that are being seen. Um, this is just number of attacks, but I would argue that complexity of attacks is scaling in a similar way to volume of, of attacks. Um, so another way of looking at this, um, if you look at um, the size of software products, so um, if uh, um, the, the larger the software products, the harder it is to defend, um, but the easier it is to attack, right? Because there are a lot more opportunities for bugs in big software. Um, if you look at operating systems, uh, back in the 90s, you're talking about three or four million lines of code for a production level operating system. Um, these days, you're talking about something north of 50 million lines of code for a production operating system. And in fact, if you start to include things like runtime libraries, um, I think last count, Debian Linux, including its critical runtime libraries, is 300 million lines of code. That is just uh, astronomical in terms of the attack surface of that piece of software. Um, and so, you know, really this is to, to sort of convince you that um, cybersecurity is perhaps the most asymmetric form of warfare in which humankind has engaged. Um, if you're an attacker, you have usually plenty of time to probe uh, defenses, right? You can very carefully uh, conduct reconnaissance and attack at a time of your choosing. Usually you have a very broad uh, choice of targets. Um, if I'm a cyber criminal, I don't care that I couldn't break into one bank. If I can break into any bank, I'm pretty happy. Um, I only need to find one critical vulnerability in the victim's network in order to have a strong foothold and steal data. But if I'm a defender, usually defenders have mere seconds to react to, to attacks. They don't get to see the attacks in advance for the most part. Um, they're often stuck defending thousands of legacy assets. I think the last OIG report I read said that the, uh, the DOE, somewhere, something like 65% of their computers are not adequately patched. Um, and um, in order to win the game, you pretty much have to close all of the vulnerabilities that any attacker might find. Otherwise, at least one of those adversaries is gonna find one of those vulnerabilities and he's gonna sell it to everyone else and then um, the game is over for you. So um, this sort of asymmetry, I think, is a very critical problem and that um, it doesn't seem like there's, there are many conventional defenses that scale to this problem. Um, of course, historically, we know that um, throughout the history of warfare, uh, deception has often been recognized as an asymmetry leveling mechanism. You can go all the way back to um, you know, Sun Tzu and his Art of War, where he said all warfare is based on deception. I'm not sure we've taken that lesson to account when uh, we consider cyber warfare at the moment. Right? We have some deception, but it's mostly on the offensive end and not a whole lot on the defensive end. Um, attackers have known this in the realm of cyber deception uh, for you know, the history of, of uh, cyber criminal activity. So if you look at um, uh, studies that have been done on top threats to organizations, um, regularly at the very top of the list is social engineering attacks. Right? There are all these famous hackers of the past. Um, I remember um, Ke Kevin Mitnick uh, mentioning that he believes that his primary skill set was um, social engineering more even than his technical skills. Right? Why, uh, why, why do I have to uh, um, decrypt a password if I can convince an administrator to give it to me? Right? It's a lot easier. Um, so um, 
this is a lesson that has been learned by our adversaries. I think we need to learn it as well. And um, there's a sort of interesting example of this that I read some years ago that I'll share with you. Um, so I, I read a case study published some years ago about a, um, an independent hacktivist who goes by the alias The Jester. And uh, The Jester is an interesting character because uh, unlike most hackers out there, uh, he considers himself a US patriot and does illegal things on the internet on behalf of what he feels are uh, US interests. And then he brags about it on his blog. So. Um, uh, there was a point uh, back in 2011 where um, he was very frustrated that there were a bunch of rival hackers out there that authorities had been attempting to apprehend, uh, part of a, a group called LulzSec, and um, he wanted to find out who these people were and leak their identities to the authorities and get them arrested. Um, but the authorities had a lot of trouble tracking these people down, they were very good. Um, so. The way he went about uh, conducting this, so keep in mind this is basically, we think, one person operating with no significant resources, just his own wits um, and a bit of technical expertise. Um, so he ran this blog and uh, one day he quietly changed his avatar on his blog to a QR code. And if you scanned that QR code, um, it jumped you to a web page that redirected you to a piece of malware that he had written that hijacks a certain kind of browser on a certain kind of phone. Um, that hijacked browser does a callback and um, the, the server that it, it phones home to does some cross-referencing behind the scenes with anonymous communications that j the jester had had with these nefarious individuals on Twitter. And if the correlated information matches, it would start tracing back and get geographic information, potentially an address, sort of correlate different positions of these people. And um, this turned out to be very successful. He actually was able to obtain the names and addresses of several of these LulzSec members. He leaked them to police and there were arrests eventually of these people. Um, and after this campaign was successful, he reported on his blog um, why he had chosen to do these things. Um, so he said that, well, first of all, there are all these people visiting my blog and most of them have no malicious purpose. But if I just quietly with no announcement change my avatar to a QR code, how many people are going to scan that QR code? Probably not many even notice the change and many who do don't bother with it. Only people who have perhaps an unhealthy interest in my activities are going to bother to do that. And um, you know, then he had various filtering mechanisms where of those of all those millions of people visiting his blog, only about 1,200 scanned the QR code. Only about 500 were using a phone that he knew that those people were probably using based on prior communications with them. And then only a small number of those cross-referenced with his hit list to be likely members of this group. And then he had a limited collection of information to then track down manually who these people were. So, you know, this is kind of interesting that a, a, basically a defender um, with no resources is able to accomplish something that um, defenders with many, many resources had failed to be able to do. And he did it with just a little bit of sleight of hand and deception uh, to get a lot of mileage out of it. So um, all of this is to try to argue that um, if we're going to make progress in cybersecurity, I think we need to really take seriously the problem of asymmetry. And one of the most promising ways to do that is to incorporate deception into defense. Um, and there are a lot of advantages potentially for doing this. Um, it's a way to shift the resource burden, which is currently heavily on defenders, over to those attackers to make life as difficult for them as it is for us. Um, it has the potential to greatly elevate the risk incurred by attackers. Right now, uh, attackers can do a lot of things with relative impunity. There's very low risk for them to probe systems. Um, let's make that risk as high as possible so that they're second guessing every apparent success that they have. Um, the idea of instead of making attackers uncertain about what's going on on the defense, let's give them certainty about things that are not true. That way I can manipulate them into actually taking actions that benefit me. Um, and then one of the big problems, I think, is uh, um, the, the problem of finding good data about uh, uh, modern attacks in order to anticipate future moves. It's very hard to get good attack data about uh, skillful uh, uh, 
adversaries. But if you use deception, the idea there is to maximize the amount of communication you have with these, uh, these threat actors and therefore get as much information about them as possible. Why cut off communication if somebody is voluntarily giving you the very information you need to mount a better defense against them? So um, uh, some of my colleagues um, have de uh, uh, who are you know, cleverer than I have decided that the, there are these sort of the four Ds of deception. Um, and they say that deception is about deflecting attention away from legitimate targets to illegitimate ones, um, distorting adversarial beliefs, making them believe something that's not true, um, depleting their resources, and then finally discovering adversarial capabilities, motives, and tactics. All right, so these are the goals of deception. And um, of these four Ds, I'm going to argue in this talk that I think discovery is the most important of the four. And the reason I say that is because um, if I manage to deflect, distort, and deplete adversaries, that helps me win an individual battle, the, the battle today. But if I can discover the, the uh, capabilities, the techniques, and the attack patterns of an adversary, that potentially gives me a winning strategy for many future battles where I can defeat this adversary. So I think that's one of the prime goals that we need to, to place at the forefront of uh, cyber deceptive defense. So in saying all this, I don't want to give you the, the mistaken impression that I think you know, deception has begun today or is never used in defense. There are plenty, there's a long and uh, great history of using cyber deception for defense. Um, all the way back in 86, Cliff Stoll wrote a really great book called The Cuckoo's Egg where he documented a, de uh, a deception that he perpetrated on um, I guess it was a nation state actor. Um, and uh, there are things like uh, Fred Cohen's famous for having um, uh, developed the deception toolkit back in the late 90s. Um, honeypot frameworks were um, advanced in the early 2000s and uh, lots of great technologies for honey documents. Um, but today, um, that sort of emerging industry has blossomed into a huge industry. Um, there are all of these modern deception products out there. Companies like uh, Rapid7, TrapX, Logarithm, Ativo Networks, Elusive Networks, Symmetria, they all have these really um, fancy deceptive firewalls and um, uh, deception enhanced honeypot frameworks, deceptive networks. Um, and in fact, some of, some of the market studies going on now estimate that this is gonna grow to a $2 billion industry by 2022. So, so this is not something that um, you know, we're leading the charge on, um, but I think as scientists, we have to sort of pause and start to wonder, um, you know, what sorts of assurances can we provide or analyses can we provide about what these things are doing? Um, you know, if, if I deploy Rapid7's deceptive network topology, is my network now 80% more secure or 40%, is there any metric there? Or what is it, you know, what assurances are we getting? How do you analyze that? Um, and these are sort of scientific questions that I think at present the, the scientific community have really left unanswered. Um, so let me pose a few of these scientific questions and sort of explore them with you. Um, so one of the scientific questions that I've been asking about these things are, you know, exactly which asymmetries between attackers and defenders can be addressed through deception. Maybe there are things that deception is just not good for. Um, and I want to know what those things are so that I don't spend a lot of money on one of these deceptive tools for something that it's just not good for. Um, or perhaps even more importantly, can you quantify what these asymmetries are and then what they are before the deceptive defense is deployed and after. Because then I know how much money to invest in one of these things and how much bang I'm, a, I'm expecting to get out of it once I deploy it. Um, if we are gonna measure these things, in what units are we going to measure them? So for example, maybe if the goal is uh, misdirection of adversaries, we should be looking at measuring um, the certainty that adversaries have about false statements, right? Measure adversarial beliefs held before and after the deception and say, okay, this is a very convincing deception for adversaries to think that there's a service here when it's not, right? Something uh, tangible. Um, or maybe the goal is to say, well, um, you know, I don't know, it's hard to measure what beliefs are held by anonymous adversaries, but at least I can say 80% more attacks were repulsed 
now that I have this deceptive defense, right? So there's a pretty hard metric that might be the useful one. Um, or maybe if my goal is this discovery uh, metric, maybe I should be saying, well, how much more information do I have about my adversary after I've deployed this? Um, and then I, I think it's not just about volume of information, it's about richness of information, right? Semantic content. So maybe there's some sort of a, um, a Shannon information gain equation going on here where we need to actually be measuring information gain from deploying these deceptions. Um, another difficult question is, um, you know, when you're, when you're looking at security of a defense, you always want to ask, what is the trusted computing base? What do I have to trust in order to be convinced that the whole system is secure against attack? But the question of what is the trusted computing base of a cyber deception is very hard to, to answer. Um, so usually deceptions involve some sort of risk trade-off. I have to tell the truth sometimes in order to tell a convincing lie. But there are a lot of organizations out there that never want to tell the truth to any adversary under any condition. So they, they feel there's an inherent risk to doing that. And somehow I'd like to be able to give them a, a, an equation that says, well, if you're willing to take that risk, the potential payoff is higher than the, the, poten you know, than the loss, right? But we don't really have any formulas right now for, for quantifying most of these things. Um, the question of evaluating deceptive defenses is one that has really plagued me in a lot of our research. What is the appropriate methodology for taking one of these defenses and evaluating its effectiveness? Um, is that all about human subjects testing? Should I get a red team together, um, pit them against the cyber deception, and then survey them and ask them, you know, where you, what do you believe now after you've attacked this system? Um, if that's the way to go, then um, what pool of subjects qualifies them to be good test subjects for this? Right? What skill level do they need to have in order for me to have any sort of meaningful evaluation of this thing? Um, what should the testing conditions be? Right? As scientists, these are usually the sorts of things that you, you, you answer before you even set the experiment up. But I'm not sure how to answer that for most of these products. Um, what's an appropriate sample size? How many people do I need? Right? If I get four red teamers together, does that represent the universe of hackers out there that's going to be attacking real products? Seems like probably not. But what's the right number? Um, and then a final question that um, is, uh, comes up surprisingly often when I have uh, conversations with folks uh, in, in various scientific disciplines, um, is cyber deception just another form of security by obscurity? Uh, we know that sec security by obscurity is dangerous. It doesn't work. Um, if, you, if your defense is to try to hide what you're doing from the attackers, they are very good at reverse engineering things and figuring out that secret, and then your defense is useless. So if this is just security by obscurity, then there should not be a science of deception. It's not science, and we shouldn't be doing it. Um, and so, um, you know, not surprisingly, uh, I'm going to argue that, um, in my opinion, cyber deception is fundamentally different than security by obscurity or by obfuscation. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think the goals are different, and therefore the mechanisms are very different. So. In my opinion, security by obscurity, um, the goal is to create uncertainty in the minds of attackers. The, the attack surface should be so confusing and so bewildering that you, the, the attacker's guesses fail with high probability. He can't make a correct guess about how to break into the system. And essentially, he becomes paralyzed. He doesn't know how to break in because the defense is very bewildering to him. That's not the goal of a deceptive defense. The deceptive events, uh, uh, defense, is its goal is to create some false certainty in the mind of the attacker. We want the attacker to actually firmly believe something that's false and then use that information to, to refine our defenses such as by collecting as much information about the attacker as we can. Keep him on the hook for as long as we can. Don't reject the connection. Keep it open for as long as he's willing to tell us stuff. Um, we want to be able to anticipate the attacker's future moves, not just block his attack today. And um, maybe even manipulate attackers into taking actions that he otherwise wouldn't have taken that help us. So these are things that typically are not the goals of an obfuscated defense. And I think they require fundamentally different approaches. 
Um, there's a similar argument I can make about deception versus moving target defense. So moving target defense is a very important defense uh, strategy. I think there's some overlap with deception, but they're not the same thing. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, moving target defense, somewhat similar to obscurity, but not necessarily. The idea of moving uh, of, of MTD is to um, is to keep the attack surface changing so often that even if the attacker knows that it's changing, he just can't keep up. Um, so there might not be obscurity. It could be obscurity, but it doesn't have to be. Um, in the software world, I would say an example of MTD is something like address space layout randomization. Every time I load the program, its memory image is different. It loads the, the libraries in random places. And that way, even the though the attacker knows that ASLR is active, he has a hard time locating the code that he wants to abuse. On the other hand, um, in a cyber deceptive uh, defense, maybe I, instead of just randomizing where these libraries get loaded, I would actually load some decoy libraries in there. So now when the attacker tries to launch a return-oriented programming attack and expects to find a gadget at a particular address, he finds a gadget there. But it's a fake one. It's one that sets off an alarm. So now I've gotten the attacker to falsely believe that ASLR was not active on that system. Actually, it is. Um, but I'm luring him into giving me more information about what gadget chain he would have executed if he had gotten into this system. And there are things at the intersection. So you can imagine um, you know, a, a defense that when an attack is de uh, detected, it takes the process image and de-randomizes it and then removes all the secrets and then lets the attacker win. Right? So now you have something where the attacker believes he's won the game, but he actually hasn't and we monitor all the network traffic and learn as much as possible about his tactics and techniques or what, he's, what his motives are. So if deception is, I think, fundamentally different than obfuscation or MTD, then we can go back to these other questions about, you know, how do you measure this? Is there any way of quantifying it? A lot of these things are about metrics. And so this, the fact that there's this common thread in many of these scientific questions leads me to speculate that if there is a science of cyber deception, it's one that is very data driven and it's highly interdisciplinary. Um, so if attack data is at the heart of what I'm seeking in deceptive defenses, I think the science that describes effective cyber deception has to include things like cognitive sciences, right? There's a human component. This is a hybrid system where adversaries are humans using tools or humans who have created tools, or tools feeding data to humans somewhere, right? And we need to then know how are humans going to respond to various um, I inputs that we give them. Um, uh, Quan Yang did a great job on Monday of, um, of advancing the idea that game theory is an essential ingredient to this. So good deceptions have many moves. It's not just a one-shot thing. And therefore, you have to anticipate what is going to be the outcome if player A makes this move, and then player B makes this move, and then maybe there's a player C that becomes involved and make another move. So game theory is another component that needs to be brought in. Um, a lot of the advantages of using a deception rather than a conventional defense, I think, are economically driven. Right? So I made this, this argument at the beginning of the talk that um, it, spending, just pouring more dollars into cyber defense, that alone is not going to solve the problem. So we have to understand what are the economic advantages and disadvantages of deploying these defenses. And then um, there are other sort of implementational things like um, computer networking, um, software engineering, I didn't put on the slide, but I think that's um, heavily involved as well. And then maybe um, sort of tying a lot of these things together, I think machine learning has a whole lot to say about the effectiveness of deception because it provides us mechanisms for analyzing streams of data um, and extracting what, what is the information gain, for example, what can we learn um, from the data brought in by a cyber deceptive defense? Or even better, what data should we be trying to collect uh, from adversaries in order to strengthen our defenses? All right, so this, this data issue is something that I've um, called in some, of my, um, in some of my papers, I call it the data drought problem. Um, and it's interesting, I found that um, the, the, um, the panel yesterday came to a similar conclusion in its discussion of one of the questions 
about uh, the role of attack data. Um, in my opinion, one of the things, one of the impediments that's really holding back a lot of advances in, in a broad range of cybersecurity uh, directions is how difficult it is to get recent accurate attack data for diverse attacks. Um, you might say, well, you know, the best sources of attack data are the real network and system logs collected by large networks and large organizations. And even if we put aside the challenges of actually getting access to that data um, and the privacy concerns, the, the big problem there is that those data sets are unlabeled. So if you get a modern data set that consists of uh, network logs, the administrators do not know which of those data points are attacks. They might not know for years that something was actually an attack and we discover later on that it was actually uh, exploitation of a vulnerability of some kind. So applying a machine learning model to that is very hard, right? You don't even have ground truth for that data. Um, an alternative to that are things like synthetic data sets, but it's very hard to generate recent attack data for that. So there are synthetic data sets um, and some of the machine learning models do very well in predicting things like anomalies or attacks. And then you dig in a little bit more deeply and find that the, um, the model was trained on attack data from the early 90s. Well, that's not representative of anything going on today. And no wonder their classification decisions are so good. Uh, but I don't think that represents what's actually going to happen in the real world when you deploy that defense. Um, Honeypots and honey nets are a great way to potentially collect a lot of good data. But there's a really serious problem. Um, I've done a lot of work with honeypots and uh, deploying them, what we find is that they collect data about attackers who are not very good. So if you deploy a honeypot, um, think about who's attacking that. Um, a skillful attacker gets a foothold in a network, compromises a workstation and conducts a traffic analysis. And the thing that he sees is that nobody who is doing real work ever accesses that server. So why am I gonna attack that server? He sort of strategically, surgically attacks only the assets that are actually providing genuine services. And the skillful attackers are very good at evading honeypots. But if you think about the utility, the, the usefulness of cyber deception, I would argue that deception is really for the attackers who are the most skillful. I mean, why do I bother to deceive the script kitty? I can block his attacks already. I don't need any information about him. I want information about the, the APTs out there. But then how do you collect attack data for them? Uh, I mean, if, if, you get, if, you, if you're lucky enough to even have one attack, that, that's one data point, right? How do you extrapolate from that? It's very difficult to get good attack data. Um, but I would argue that cyber deception is an excellent way of getting a whole lot of data about attackers. Because if you finally get that you know, one advanced threat actor trying to, to break into your system, why do you want to cut off communication with that person? Keep that communication going as long as you can because you want to get as much data as you can from that interaction. So um, all of this sort of comes together into what I would say are, uh, I'll pitch as four directions um, that I see as important avenues of discovery for advancing a science of cyber deception. And um, because, um, you know, all good sermons have to have points that begin with the same letter. Mine all begin with A's. So, um, so I'm first going to start with uh, assimilation. So I'm gonna argue that um, deceptions that are um, orthogonal and independent of genuine systems are not effective, that we need to be integrating deceptions into things. Um, and then I'll mention some things about automation. I think um, putting too many humans in the loop, that doesn't scale well. Um, we need more automation. Um, adaptation, um, deceptions that can evolve to meet the needs of the defender and the, um, the skills of the uh, uh, attacker over time are important. And then finally, this question of how do you obtain any sort of formal assurance for a deceptive defense? So let me start with uh, the assimilation uh, idea. So, so my philosophy of cyber deceptive defense is that uh, we need to stop thinking about deception as sort of a separate layer of security that we put on top of other layers. Instead, we need to adopt the philosophy that every cyber object should be equipped with deceptive responses to attacks. Even and especially the cyber objects that are providing genuine services to legitimate users. Deceptions should be everywhere. 
And to sort of make this a little more concrete, since I'm a software engineering guy, um, in software engineering, if we set out to design secure software, typically there are three requirements that we look at, right? We want to enforce data integrity, uh, data confidentiality, and then avail uh, data availability or service availability requirements. And then we set out to establish what we can obtain in each of those degrees of assurance. That list is incomplete. We need bullet number four. How deceptive is this software when it encounters something that it knows is an attack? Please don't respond to the attack with error message, I just detected your attack, and by the way, here's how you can defeat me next time. That is not a good error message to be get, delivering to attackers, but many times that's what modern software does. It gives very, very helpful error messages to attackers. Um, so one of the ways in which we've been experimenting with this is a line of research that we've called honey patching. To, so to set this up, um, many of you know that the, the way most attacks begin in the real world is that the attacker performs some sort of reconnaissance as the first step in his kill chain. So for example, um, a software vulnerability will be disclosed to the public and the vendor will release a patch for that vulnerability and then all the IT people all over the world go running about and try to apply that patch to all of their software to make sure that the vulnerability is closed. Meanwhile, the attackers race them to see if they can break into things before they get patched. So they craft something called a probe payload, which is just an input to the program designed to exercise the vulnerability that was just patched. And they start firing this probe payload, which is very generic, um, at lots of different servers. And when they fire it at a patched server, the patched server says, I refuse your connection. I detected that you attacked me. My answer is no. And then the attacker crosses that IP address off his list, and he goes to the next server that he's found in the network and tries probing that one. And he keeps going until, inevitably, in a huge network, he finds the server in the basement somewhere that everybody forgot to patch, and he fires the probe payload at that, and that unpatched server responds in a very different way. It um, crashes and restarts, or it returns some kind of garbage string, and then when the attacker sees that, he smiles and knows, aha, this is a server that I can penetrate later on with something much more potent than a probe payload, get a nice foothold, and perhaps infiltrate this network. So um, in my research group, we were thinking about this problem, and we started to ask, you know, why is it that patches uh, typically return this very nice, you know, connection refused response, even when they know that the only way they would have gotten this input is if somebody maliciously crafted an input that was designed to exercise this very rare control flow pattern. So we built this system called Red Herring, where we converted vendor-released patches into what we called honey patches. So the idea is, um, the, the honey patch implements the same security protection as the patch did, except that when it detects any input that exercises the patched vulnerability, instead of just saying no to the connection, it quietly and transparently forks that connection over to a decoy environment that's actually running the unpatched software. So it's actually unpatched over there. And so the response the attacker gets is exactly as if he had successfully penetrated an unpatched server. So think about what the network looks like to an attacker after you do this, right? So you're a defender and you try to honey patch as many machines as you can, but you, know, you miss the one in the basement. Um, and then the attacker starts probing your network. Well, everything looks vulnerable. All of the servers are apparently unpatched. It gets the same response from all of them. And now the attacker, you know, maybe he doesn't realize that this is a deception. Then you get lots of nice data about attackers. Maybe he does realize, oh, this person's using honey patching, but that doesn't really help him that much. He still has to guess now at which, maybe this server over here is the one I really broke into, maybe this other one is the one I really broke into, I'm not sure. Either way, we get lots more interaction with attackers to see what they would have done after the first probe payload. They have to then take more steps, and we're monitoring all those steps. We can learn data about how to resist or, uh, or how to detect that activity in the future. And so, um, you know, there's lots of opportunities for disinformation as well, right? We can take those, de those decoy servers, maybe put fake credit card numbers in there, and then if the attacker um, uses one of those credit card numbers, we can track their movements in some foreign country, right? This is more information than we would have gotten if we just said connection denied. Right? 
So we did this for um, web servers, and we honey a whole bunch of um, vulnerabilities, and it seemed to work really well. So we were able to get um, things like uh, live in the wild attack data about exploitations of Heartbleed within hours of that patch's um, release to the public. So they were very fast to deploy, uh, very low cost. In fact, we, we did a little um, sort of general study where we tried to understand how feasible is it to do this on a mass scale. And our sort of preliminary results were that it seemed like to us in about 65% of cases, it is so easy to convert a patch to a honey patch that there's just no reason not to do it. Why on earth advertise to your adversaries that you've patched something? That's not something we want them to know. So why bother to return these nice responses um, to things that would be so easy to, it basically took no effort at all, change one line of code to make it a honey patch instead of a patch. Um, so this sort of brings me to the problem of uh, automation, right? A lot of present day cyber deceptive defenses have significant reliance on humans in the loop. So the, the, um, the human is sitting there on the other side on the defense and um, telling lies to the attacker and trying to manipulate them into doing things. This is a very slow way to do things that does not scale to a, a world in which you see thousands or even millions of attacks per day. Um, so I think uh, mechanisms that can fully automate this whole deceptive game that is played are really important. Um, and, um, you know, in defense of this, I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, a book that uh, um, Ehab and Jim Peng and Cliff and I edited recently and that's now out, you can, you can purchase uh, from Springer, called Autonomous Cyber Deception. And one of the main theses of the book is that um, we need to be integrating deception enhancing capabilities into the tools that produce cyber objects so that we can sort of mass produce deceptions. Um, and you know, from a software standpoint, that would probably mean doing things like enhancing compilers so that they can produce software that has some sort of deceptive response to attempted attacks. Compilers already do a whole bunch of things that try to make software more secure behind the scenes. Most of those things advertise the fact that they're being done. But if you could somehow integrate deceptive capabilities, that would be much more potentially useful for doing attack uh, data generation or, or collection. So one of the ways we've done this is uh, my, Fred, uh, my, my student Fred Arujo, who's now at IBM TJ Watson, um, he actually built an extension to the LLVM C compiler um, where he equipped the compiler with the capability to, um, at the, the administrator's choosing, um, find all of the secret data in its address space and automatically redact it and replace it with honey data. And so this allows you to create C programs that when they detect an attack, they quick remove all the secrets, put fake data in there, and then let the attacker break in. And now suddenly we can disinform um, or, or misdirect attackers and not have to completely reprogram the software. It works on you know, regular C code. And we did large products, so um, we took Apache and only had to change about 50 lines of its 2.2 million lines of source to actually integrate this capability into the server. Um, and this is a publicly available branch of LLVM that you can go out and, and get. There are lots of other opportunities, I think, for increased automation that haven't been adequately explored. Um, one of them that I'm, you know, I would really like to see is uh, in the area of honey data generation. So we have lots of great algorithms that will generate fake documents automatically usually from some sample of, of uh, uh, benign documents. But what I'd really like to be able to do as a defender is automatically generate whole collections of documents that are mutually consistent with one another, right? so they don't, they don't contradict each other, and they work together to tell a specific lie that I want to tell. So for example, if I want attackers to believe that the password file is located on some particular machine, then I want a collection of documents that tell a whole bunch of facts that when you put them together make the attacker realize that's where the password file is. I don't know of any technology where we can do that, like tell a convincing narrative across many different documents, but that's really what the sort of deception we need in order to convince attackers to do things for us. Um, there are some other things that I have on the slide that I won't go into here, but things like automated retaliation, right? Can I, 
Can I learn counterattacks from attacks automatically and then deploy them against adversaries? Um, and all sorts of analyses that we could do potentially automatically on attack data, like um, can I decide with some confidence level whether two apparently independent adversaries are actually collaborating with one another? Um, these are the sorts of things that would reduce the amount of involvement of human in the loop and then narrow down the, the human involvement to only the most important attacks where we need a human to make a decision. So when it comes to uh, adaptation, um, I think that uh, Kuang Yang did an excellent job. Um, if you missed his talk, I think the, the slides are, are online and uh, he had a lot of interesting information. So, um, you know, in, in his opinion, so I'm, I'm gonna try to channel him, in his, here is his picture, right? He's the, actually the one saying this. Um, so he was saying, t arguing that um, good deceptive defenses are a multi-stage game. It's not just one deceptive looking thing. It's something that responds and then responds again. And uh, such games in game theory, it's known, are controlled by equations that have various parameters about risk and uh, probability of success and things like that. So um, these are games in which we need to choose the parameters to be specific to each adversary we encounter or maybe to the particular adversaries we want to deceive versus the ones that we don't care about, like the script kitties. Um, and one of the good motivations for this is um, I think as, as cybersecurity professionals, we're sort of stuck sometimes on the idea that we, we treat adversaries as annoyances that we want to shut down as soon as we can. But we should start thinking about cyber attackers as resources, right? If somebody attacks my network, I could say, well, just shut down the connection, don't wanna to talk to that person anymore. Or I can say, ah, free pen tester. Right? I'll divert them to a decoy environment and put some software in there that I wonder whether there's a bug in there. Maybe they'll find it for me. That's great. Right? It's like Mechanical Turk, but for criminals. Right? Um, if I want threat data, good. They're gonna offer me some threat data. I'll take that. Right? Um, if I have multiple attackers, maybe I'll lie to one attacker and say, oh yeah, my most important asset is that other attacker's command and control center. I'll get them to attack each other. That would be good for me, right? So these are, these are people volunteering their time, apparently, and let's just use them. Uh, and so this last one, um, I'm very interested in the idea that maybe we can convince attackers to answer specific questions that we have as defenders that would really help us. So one of the ways that we've been doing that in my lab is we've been trying to develop something called uh, deception-assisted firewalls. And the idea here is that um, you know, firewalls have a limited collection of features that they can efficiently monitor in order to decide whether incoming traffic streams are attacks or whether they're benign. Um, and because they have to make these decisions quickly and with limited features, some of the attacks slip through. Um, but other defense layers sometimes pick up that this was actually an attack. And usually those other defense layers right now, they just say connection refused. Right, so that, that's, that's the end of the game. But we've been trying to build software layers that instead say, okay, let's keep the attacker on the hook as long as we can, learn as much as we can about that, and then feed that information back to the firewall in order to help train its classifier to better detect the attack in the future. And in fact, we, this is a, a two-way communication so that if the firewall says, hey, you know, I've, got, I've learned a really good decision boundary, except over here in this area of the feature space, well, then we train the deception to try to get the attacker to give us data in that area of the feature space so that it learns that part of the classification boundary better. So I have a little scatter plot that we um, obtained from one of our recent exper experiments where you can see on the left, initially the firewall's feature space is this very um, integrated mix of uh, blue benign traffic and red uh, attack traffic. and It's very hard to distinguish which is which. But over time, as this feedback loop develops, um, the, the feature space is refined in such a way that the classification boundary becomes much more apparent. And the firewall becomes better and better at, at, at classifying these attacks automatically. And it's the result of steering attackers into helping us learn what the classification boundary actually is. So this sort of brings me to the last of the A's. Um, the question of assurance. Um, and I think there's a, a big open question that is sort of begging scientists to answer it, 
and that is what is the right way to um, scientifically evaluate the usefulness or the effectiveness of deception? Um, and um, keeping in mind that probably cyber deceptions are only useful uh, or are most useful against adversaries who are already sufficiently resourceful and creative and skillful to have breached your other defenses. If they're so easy to block that you don't need deception, then I don't care how well the deception works on those people. Um, and one of the, th the questions we've been really grappling with in my lab, and that you know, I'll sort of pose to you, is what should be the role of human subjective uh, uh, testing in evaluating deceptions? That's usually the first thing that scientists I talk to think of when I say, how would we evaluate this? And they say, well, you sit a bunch of humans down and you pit, pit them against the deception, you find out whether they were deceived, and now you know how good your cyber deceptive defense is. And um, we've been trying to do that, and let me give you um, a, a specific example of why I have major misgivings about that as an evaluation strategy. So here's a pair of plots. Um, this is an experiment that was just done in the past few weeks in my lab. And um, on the left, you can see we deployed one of these deceptive firewalls, and we um, streamed synthetic attack data at it to see how well it per would perform. And the synthetic data is designed to simulate the activities of thousands of different attackers and also hundreds of thousands of benign users um, evolving their attacks in different ways based on historical data. So was, a lot of work went into um, generating that synthetic data set. And you can see that the deceptive defense gradually gets better over time as it witnesses more and more of these attacks until finally it gets to about 90% accuracy at the end. So then we decided, okay, well then, you know, the next step up from synthetic data is to try this on real humans, right? So we got uh, a group of 10 students together who are good at capture the flag competitions, so they have some good skills, and we pitted them against this cyber deceptive defense, and we got a completely different looking plot. Um, the plot, if you can see the green line on the right graph, um, it almost instantly jumps to near 100% accuracy after witnessing one attack. And if you were to evaluate your defense with just that, you would say, this is amazing. All it needs is to see one attack and it can resist everything. And we started looking at the data more carefully and we realized, okay, the problem here is that students are a kind of homogenous group. They have approximately the same skill sets, the same motivations, and um, the same tactics. And once that defense sees one of their attacks, it's pretty good at finding them all. So it's not really needing to learn much. It's actually a much easier uh, a test of, of, of worthiness of this defense than the synthetic data, which is sort of counterintuitive. You'd think that you know, human subjects would be the ultimate challenge. And so I'm not so sure that's true. The synthetic data is a lot harder than the humans. And you know, maybe the problem is that, well, you should have gotten a better, a larger pool of human subjects, and they should have been more diverse, and they should have been more skillful. When you start putting all of that together, I think it starts to become questionable whether any academic institution could ever assemble a pool of human subjects that would do justice uh, to that defense, to evaluating it. So um, suppose we had got 100 students together. Um, I'll note that Hacker One has over 166,000 registered hackers. Um, 28,000 hackers attended DEF CON last year. Is my 100 students representative of those threats, I mean, I, it just doesn't seem reasonable to me. Um, what skill set do I need? You know, how much money would I have to pay to get really you know, advanced, the Top Gun style hackers, the ones we really want to deceive? Um, Rand concluded a few years ago that the black hat market is now more profitable than the drug trade. That's a lot of money. I don't have that much money. Uh, I don't think, um, you know, if I submit a, a, a grant proposal to Cliff, I don't think he's going to fund that. Um, and even if somehow I manage to assemble the perfect red team, I can never use those people again. They're tainted once I do one experiment with them. Now they know about the deception. They're not independent anymore. So I have to do all that work over again. And, um, you know, maybe you say, well, um, okay, instead of assembling a red team, you should just deploy this thing on the internet. Let everyone attack it. Then you have real live attackers. Who's attacking that? I don't think it's the APTs. You've got nothing valuable to offer them. Right? You're getting the script kitties. So again, you have this sort of very weak evaluation. Um, 
Can you reproduce that experiment? This is a question that the panel yesterday grappled with as well. Um, if, you, if you read about um, you know, the, the uh, news headlines in psychology, you might know that they're, in psychology they're currently facing something called the replication crisis. And um, some folks have, have gone back and tried to reproduce some of the famous studies that you read about in psychology textbooks and have discovered that they are not reproducible. The effect that was observed by the researchers when they did that study does not seem to be an effect that is real. And yet those have been in the psychology textbooks for decades. So now they're all facing, well, you know, how, how often do we actually try to reproduce this and was this really symptomatic of the effects we see in the real world? Um, I would caution uh, the whole community of scientists, let's not replicate the replication crisis. Right? I mean, if we are basing our studies on human subject evaluations that cannot be reproduced, um, then I think it's very shaky and we are uh, at risk of deploying defenses that are doomed to failure in the real world. So, you know, I would advance um, better methods of synthetic data generation are a really important next step in this. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying that um, I think we can transition cyber deception from art to science um, because cyber deception uh, science is a vital ingredient for scaling these asymmetries. Um, I think it's a data-driven interdisciplinary science and we need to be um, projecting our research along these four avenues of assimilation, automation, adaptation, and assurance. Um, and I'll just wrap up there. <laughs>